welcome to worship, virtual worship at First Congregational Church of Rochester, Michigan. My name is Case Van Kempen. I'm the pastor here at First Congregational, and we're glad that you've joined us for worship today. If you are someone who's new to this broadcast, to this video, we're glad that you're with us. We hope you'll join us often, and uh, we hope you'll join us in person when uh, that begins somewhere down the road. Uh, our reopening team met last week. We're not ready to reopen yet. We're being uh, very cautious following best medical advice. So we'll keep you posted, but we're glad you're here for our virtual worship today. This is a communion service, so we hope you have some bread and some juice or wine prepared for the service today. If not, you can pause this a moment and uh, maybe go get a piece of bread and some juice or wine and be ready to celebrate communion with us at that part of the service. This coming week is a little bit quieter week at church. I mean figuratively at church amongst our church people. Not as many committee meetings this week, not as many Zoom meetings. Uh, the Thoughtful Christian Book Study Group meets Wednesday at 1 as usual. And you can sign up for that. You'll see the uh, sign up in the Tuesday tickler, the email that we send out, or contact the church office or contact me if you need sign up information. Since it's a little bit quieter week, uh, I thought one of the things I would invite you to do is to go to UCC Resources, United Church of Christ, UCC Resources online. Just Google that, UCC Resources, and you'll be amazed at what you find there. You can order masks, t-shirts, uh, Black Lives Matter. They've got a great mask that says vote on it, big letters. We're encouraging people to get out and vote this fall, of course. Um, you can get floor mats, you can get coloring books for your kids with all kinds of great justice issues and uh, uh, all, the, all the kind of uh, things that you want to teach your children. So there's a lot of uh, interesting things there at the UCC website. UCC resources, just Google that, it'll come up. Uh, have fun shopping. Uh, just to update quickly, I've been working on the membership roles of the church, which is something that interim ministers do. Uh, they generally go over the membership roles to make sure they're as up-to-date as possible before a new pastor begins. So if you have any membership updates, family members that have moved, new addresses, new phone numbers, new email, please let the church office know. We do want to try to keep our membership records as accurate and as complete as possible. Uh, be aware too that I'll be sending out a letter to, to people that maybe we haven't seen for a while. It is not our goal to, to shove people off the membership list, far from it. We're just trying to get in touch with everyone, uh, to get current information, uh, to ask them how they would like us to regard their membership if they haven't been here for a while. Uh, just be aware we're trying to do this with as much grace and compassion as we can. Uh, but it's a necessary thing for us to do to keep the membership roles complete. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Jennifer Edenson for our call to worship. Please join me in the call to worship. Come, all who are hungry and thirsty, the Lord will provide for our needs. Come this day to the table of the Lord. Here we will find welcome and sustenance. Come to this time of gathering and praise. Lord, we come with open hearts and spirits to receive your gracious gift of love. Please join me now in the opening prayer. Here we are, Lord, your people, your church, meeting together in a new way. We welcome each other and we welcome you. Make yourself known to us in new ways through our worship, our prayers, and our understanding of your word today. Feed us at your table and send us out with encouragement and new hope. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. Kate, Miss Lisa's here to thank a lot of special people who helped me with Vacation Bible School this summer. It was different. It was all virtual. Um, we had Mr. Ken George who helped put all of these videos together and helped put them on Facebook so everybody could access the, the videos. Super job, Ken, thanks. Um, we had Miss Stephanie Lang. She helped with the yoga movements for all the kids. She taught all those classes on video. Um, we had Ann Musson who did a lot of the crafts and activities and I know the girls helped. 
Thank you, Anne. And Kate Cole, you are so super. She uh, came up with science activities for the kids and um, we went back and forth with some of the items and Pastor Case even brought us some ice cube trays. So I thank you so much, Kate. You're a gem. And I can't forget to thank um, Grace and Layla who did the Bible story puppet shows for the kids. They were super awesome. Thank you. And Jessica, all your help and support. And um, they also helped um, hand out all the supply kits. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, everyone for your prayers and your, your contributions, your help with supplies and everything. I thank you. And Vacation Bible School Compassion Camp was a huge success. We'll do it again another year. Hopefully we'll all be together and be able to share with that. So talk about sharing. I'd love to share some pictures. Um, so enjoy. Bye for now. See you next week. There are two gospel lessons today. The first one comes from Matthew chapter 14, verses 13 to 21. Now when Jesus heard this, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. And when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds, and all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate 
were about 5,000 men, besides women and children. This is the time in the service when we would normally collect the morning tithes and offerings, and we are so grateful for your faithful giving. We thank you that you've been sending your, your checks to the church, you're dropping them by. Uh, the church office is open Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday, regular hours. I'm often here on Wednesday as well. I don't always have the door unlocked, so you might need to knock or ring the bell. But uh, we thank you for uh, getting your gifts to church, and God has truly blessed us uh, this year. Uh, with the resources that he's given us for doing our ministry. I invite you to join me in the offertory prayer of dedication. Let us pray. Holy God of mercy, redemption and grace, today we bring our gifts and pray that you will dedicate them to your work of love and reconciliation with all your children. These gifts seem small when balanced against what Christ has given us and what you continue to give us through the Holy Spirit in our giving. May we grow in gratitude, trust, and faithfulness. In the name of Christ, who gave all for us, we pray. Amen. Today's second gospel lesson comes from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 11 to 21. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, asking him for a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, and getting into the boat again, he went across to the other side. Now the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out! Beware of the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. They said to one another, It's because we have no bread. And becoming aware of it, Jesus said to them, Why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the five thousand, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They said to him, Twelve. And the seven for the four thousand? How many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? And they said to him, Seven. Then he said to them, Do you not yet understand? The title of today's message is The True Meaning of Compassion. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. While the feeding of the 5,000 is a familiar story, we don't always remember the lesson that we're supposed to take away from this story. Even the disciples missed the point of Jesus' lesson, and they were right there with Jesus when he was performing the miracle. In the last verse that we read from Mark, Jesus said, Do you not yet understand? And that's a challenge not only for the disciples, but for us too. The scene opens just after the death of John the Baptist. When Jesus heard about that, he went by boat to a deserted place to be alone for a while. He had been attracting large crowds wherever he went, and when the multitude saw that Jesus had left by boat, they followed him on foot to that same deserted place. When Jesus saw the crowd, he had compassion for them, and he began healing their sick. And then as it grew late, the disciples told Jesus that he should send the crowd away so that they could get some food. And Jesus said, they need not go away. You give them something to eat. And then when the disciples came up with five loaves and two fish, Jesus fed the entire crowd. And after everyone had eaten, there were 12 baskets of food left over. 
The key word in this story is compassion. In the original Greek language, it's esplanknisthe, esplanknisthe, which means to be moved in one's inward parts. The Greeks believed that the liver, uh, the spleen, and the gallbladder were the, the seat of the emotions. And we still maintain something of that thought today when we talk about having a gut feeling or going with your gut. At any rate, all we need to know is that Jesus felt compassion for the crowd. He identified their need. He asked the disciples to help meet that need, even though they didn't know uh, how they possibly could. And that's the lesson. When we are confronted by a crowd of any size, literally or figuratively, out of all the feelings we might have toward them, which Jesus could have had too, annoyance, frustration, condescension, a better reaction, one we can learn, is to have compassion. And being compassionate, we should identify whatever need we see in the crowd. Let me give you an example of this. One of the churches that I served as an interim had a very large youth ministry. It was not uncommon for between 175 and 200 young people to show up for one of their regular weekly meetings. The youth pastor loved hanging out with these kids. He made an effort to get to know all of them and to identify their particular needs. He had taken one wall of his office, he had painted it with that magnetic paint that you can get, and he had these little white magnets, and he wrote the names of the kids on each magnet, put them on the wall in three categories. There was the crowd, the committed, and the core. The crowd were just the kids who showed up for the weekly meetings, uh, for the fun and the activities and so on. Then the committed were the kids who also were involved in some additional activities, Bible studies, uh, leadership, youth leadership meetings, and so on. And then the core, these were the young people who had made a faith commitment to Jesus and had become members of that particular congregation. Well, the youth pastor put most of his energy into the crowd, uh, trying to meet their needs. He knew that he wasn't likely to get a faith commitment from these young people if there was some unmet need uh, in their lives, things that had to be dealt with first before they could really start considering a faith commitment in their lives. The unfortunate thing was that some of the members of that church thought that the youth pastor wasn't giving enough of his time to their kids, to the congregation's own kids, and they were always putting pressure on them to spend less time with the crowd and more time uh, with the kids who were already committed or in the core. Jesus had compassion on the crowd and he identified their need. But the disciples responded like those church leaders. They responded with skepticism and even doubt. We have nothing here, they said, but these five loaves and two fish. If the disciples had been cautious church trustees, they would have said, but pastor, we don't have a line item in the budget for feeding crowds in remote places. Jesus had compassion. Jesus identified a need and the disciples responded with skepticism and doubt. This is where a lot of ministry ideas go to shrivel up and die. Um, in another congregation that I served, there were fewer than 20 children in their children's ministry program. Um, yet 225 children showed up for their annual vacation Bible school. Nearly 400 children showed up for the Easter egg hunt. And more than 425 showed up for trick or treat. Excuse me, trunk or treat. It's the trick or treat you do in the church parking lot, trunk or treat. 425 kids. This was a community where there was a large crowd of families with small kids. And when I suggested to the church leaders that maybe we should consider some kind of expanded summer outreach program, something more than the VBS, but a summer outreach program for all these kids, the answer I got was, well, we don't have the room and we don't have the staff and we don't have the budget. The disciples didn't believe that they had enough resources either. But when they gave 
what they had to Jesus. He began breaking it, and over 5,000 people were fed. Two things to note here. One, a little placed in the hands of Jesus can become a lot. Second, we may think that we don't have much, but we often have more than we realize we have, and what we have can become enough. I never cease to be amazed by what Jesus can do when we place a little in Jesus' hands, especially when it comes to ministries of compassion. In the last church that I served as a settled pastor, a regular pastor, there was a couple who had a son with uh, developmental uh, issues, developmental disabilities. As he became a teenager, his parents realized that there wasn't any place for him to hang out with uh, young people who had the same kinds of uh, issues in their lives. Uh, so in 2007, his parents began a program called Compassionate Heart Ministries. It's a drop-in ministry for young people with mild, uh, mild to moderate developmental problems. Now they started with their own son and a few other young people like him, and they identified a need, a place where these young people could find fellowship and activities that were appropriate for them. They talked to some other people, they recruited a few other volunteers, they added some of their own money, and they put all of it into Jesus' hands. Six years later, they were serving over 200 families with developmentally disabled children. They had over 450 volunteers who logged more than 6,600 hours per year. And since then, they've built their own dedicated facility just for these young people at the cost of millions of dollars, it's paid for. They started with just their own son and a few of his friends. A little placed in the hands of Jesus can become a lot. Mark tells us that Jesus did this miracle, not just once, but twice. There was also a feeding of the 4,000 with seven loaves and a few fish and seven baskets of food left over. In the verses that we read from Mark's gospel, the second feeding had just, just finished, and um, the crowd had gone on their way, and Jesus and the disciples had gotten into a boat, and they went to the region of Dalmanutha. There they encountered Pharisees, and the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign from heaven, and Jesus sighed deeply, and he said, why does this generation ask for a sign? Truly, I tell you, no sign will be given to this generation. It's possible and even likely that this comment was just as much for us as it was for the Pharisees, and we'll see why in just a moment. Jesus and the disciples got back into the boat, and Mark gives us the little detail that the disciples had forgotten to bring any bread with them in the boat, except they just had one loaf. Well, at this point, Jesus said to them, he's teaching them, watch out, he said, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod. And the disciples discussed this with each other, uncertain as to what Jesus meant. And eventually they came up with a conclusion, it is because we have no bread. Well, Jesus heard them talking. And he said, why are you talking about having no bread? Do you still not perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Do you have eyes and fail to see? Do you have ears and fail to hear? And do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? 12, they answered. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you collect? They answered seven. And then Jesus said, do you not yet understand? The lesson Jesus was trying to teach the disciples and us has nothing to do with bread. And for the disciples to think that Jesus was warning them about the yeast of the Pharisees because it had something to do with bread was just clueless. 
The reason Jesus warned them about the yeast of the Pharisees and the yeast of Herod was because he didn't want that kind of skeptical and doubtful attitude to take root and take hold and spread among his followers. When the Pharisees asked Jesus for a sign, they just wanted Jesus to do it all. They wanted to be an audience. They didn't want to be participants. They wanted to just stand back and watch Jesus do his magic. Sort of like Jesus as David Copperfield. Wow, son of God, you made 5,000 people. Uh, you fed 5,000 people with loaves and fish. Now, can you make the camel disappear? Having just fed large crowds of people twice with meager resources, Jesus didn't want the disciples to think that now they could just sit back and let Jesus do everything. When he fed the 5,000, again, when he fed the 4,000, Jesus specifically said to the disciples, you, you give them something to eat. Having compassion doesn't mean that we just stand back and let Jesus take care of everything. It means that we take a risk, or to put it in biblical terms, it means that we demonstrate faith. We take whatever we have, however small it might seem, and we trust that Jesus will make it sufficient. I can't tell you how many times I've told church leaders, it's probably, let's see, I've served about 20 churches as a settled pastor, as an interim, so probably 20 different times I've said to church leaders, if the cause is right, if we have identified a need which is aligned with the purposes of God, then we don't need to worry about resources. Whatever we have offered in faith will be sufficient. And most often, more than sufficient, we will be amazed at the abundance that God provides. Jesus is compassionate, and he wants us to have compassion as well. To see the crowd, to identify the needs, to take whatever we have, however small it may seem, and to put it in the hands of Jesus and to have faith that Jesus will provide. Amen. As we come to our time for prayer today, we've been asked to remember uh, Don and Ella Steele's son-in-law, Joe. He had surgery this week, which went well. We're grateful for that. And uh, we'll continue to keep Joe in our prayers. We've been asked to pray for Laurel Heinegger, who was hospitalized this week. We pray for her healing and for her well-being. And we uh, were informed that Jerry Eichmann, father of Joanne Clack, has entered hospice care, and he's surrounded by family in New Bern, North Carolina. Let's come before God in prayer. Holy and gracious God, we give you thanks for the gift of life, for the gift of your Son, and for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Lead us through the trials of our current time, the suffering and the sorrow, the challenges and the struggles, the tired times and the dark places. Be with those who weep, who cannot sleep, those who have no peace, uh, who seek release. Lead us with grace, with love, and with peace. Fill us with hope, with patience, with stamina, Transform us in your image, in the likeness of your Son, in ways that honor your name. Transform us to grow, to understand, and to see. Transform us so that we can be made whole, and in wholeness may we be the hands and the heart of Christ. Hear our prayers. We ask for Don and Ella's son-in-law, Joe, and for Laurel, and for Jerry, for any others in our congregation who are dealing with illness or injury or the effects of aging, we pray, Lord God, that you would bless our congregation so that we in turn may bless all those around us. We thank you for hearing our prayer today, and we pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
Friends, it's our privilege today to celebrate together the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. I invite you to join me in the communion liturgy. The Holy One be with you and also with you. Open your hearts to the one who is love. We open our hearts to you, O God. Let us give thanks to God who gathers us together. To the one who welcomes us to the table, we give thanks and praise. God, your invitation to come and feast in your presence is but a taste of the love you extend to us every day. By your very nature, you are always seeking us out, searching for ways to connect with us and to connect us. You meet us in the most ordinary of places and you make them sacred. By your grace, we come to recognize the holiness that dwells in the world around us, in our neighbors, in our own internal depths. Therefore, we join our vo voices with your people on earth and all the company of the heavens, offering praise to you, Holy, Holy, Holy One, God of justice and love. Heaven and earth are full of your wonder. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, and blessed is your eternal table. You welcome all who thirst for justice and hunger to grow in love. You ask us to extend this same welcome to all our neighbors, but God, since our beginning, we have struggled. And so in your love for us, you took on flesh in Jesus. Through his life, you pointed to your presence on the margins. You revealed the sacredness in all of life. You showed us how to live together, even among forces of destruction. Believing it could transform the world as Jesus proclaimed the good news, he called for the captives to be set free. He spoke of the lowly being lifted up. He talked of redistributing wealth and eradicating the causes of poverty. His commitment to practicing love knew no bounds, not even the bounds of death. On the night of his arrest, Jesus shared a meal with his companions. He took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal, he took the cup, blessed it, and shared it, saying, this cup is poured out, that is poured out, is the new covenant. In remembrance of all you have done to save us, we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ was birthed among us. Christ was killed among us. Christ rises again among us. Pour out your spirit on these gifts, O God. Make these ordinary elements into the sacred gift of your presence with us once again. May they awaken us anew to your everlasting invitation into a life of resurrection. Enliven us in our pursuit of a world where all needs are met, power is balanced, and the worth of every creature and creation is celebrated. In collective longing for a taste of your kingdom on earth, we join together in echoing the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. And the cup of blessing which we bless is the communion of Christ's blood. O 
Let us pray. We thank you, Lord, that again we have been fed at your table and you have encouraged and nourished us with your presence. We pray that your grace would be with us as we go forth from this table and we pray that we would meet the needs of those we meet, reaching out with what we have, offering them our gifts and our resources. We pray, Lord God, that we would make this world more like the world above. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. For the benediction today, I'm standing by the faith banner because faith is what is required if we're going to demonstrate compassion. As Jesus had compassion, so may we also have faith enough to have compassion on the crowds, on all the people that we meet. And as we go forth, sharing our gifts with the world, may the blessing of God Almighty, God the Creator, God the Redeemer, and God the Spirit be with us now and always. Amen. Go in peace. peace.